Please take your seats. Good morning, everyone. And a very warm welcome to you this morning to our service. It's uh, great to see you. I was joking with some of the folks on the way in that uh, you wouldn't need a car or a bus or anything to get here this morning. You'd just get blown along the pavement, wouldn't you? It's been a rather blustery morning. Let's hope that it settles down as the day goes on. A special welcome to visitors who are with us this morning. Uh, Jim and Betty McNeil are here and we very warmly Welcome you, come all the way from the wilds of Hamilton, so that's a, <laughs> quite a journey. But uh, we also welcome, now I'm going to read this out because otherwise I'll get it wrong. We welcome Agnes Miller, who is visiting us from the Gold Coast in Queensland, Australia. You know, we're used to this weather, that's for sure. Where are you, Agnes? Where are you? She's here somewhere. Oh, don't, tell me that she, don't tell me that the weather's put her off. Oh, there she is, right at the back. Hi. Agnes, you're very welcome. Agnes was born in Motherwell. I'm not going to tell you when and embarrass her, but it wasn't yesterday nor the day before. And uh, she's an auntie to Stuart and Jean Watson. Uh, she's very involved in the church, the Uniting Church on the Gold Coast. That's in Robina. So imagine coming all the way from Australia to worship with us. That shows you our famous spreading. Anyway, you're very welcome, and it's, it's absolutely great to see you. I've got a chance to welcome you properly with a holy hug at the end of the service. Well, a few news items just to highlight before we begin our service this morning. You would see that on your seats, uh, some of the seats at least, there was a leaflet about our Christmas craft tabletop sale, and we do encourage you to come along and support that next Saturday morning and afternoon. If you're not able to be here yourself, then do pass the leaflet on to someone else, if you would, to encourage them to come along. And that's a precursor to our Christmas fair, which is at the beginning of December. But ahead of that, you've got a chance to do the easiest quiz yet. If you haven't picked one up for a donation of a pound, there are some at both the front and the rear doors. I'm told it's very easy. I haven't even started it, so... I'm not absolutely certain that I'll be able to do it, but there we go. Uh, well done to those who remembered to change their clocks backwards last night. You've had an extra hour in your bed or maybe an extra hour of prayer or whatever it was. Um, and well done to the one person I've heard already this morning who managed to change her clock forwards. <laughs> so there you go. Never mind. In mentioning prayer, we continue to have our prayer groups this week. Tomorrow is Monday evening, but on Wednesday afternoon, the prayer group um, is not meeting this week for a variety of reasons. So if you were thinking about coming along, then wait until the following week. However, there are still some slips for prayer requests at the front and the rear door. There are also, uh, there's also an opportunity if you want to put in prayer requests through our church website. You can just go to the home page and there's a box to fill in. There was one actually came in this morning through the website. So please do submit your prayer requests which are treated with confidentiality and are prayed over on a regular basis. In your prayers uh, this week, would you please remember the family of Jean Miller? If you've seen the screens or read the news sheet, you will see that Jean passed away last week. Her funeral service is on Tuesday at <coughs> Holy Town Crematorium from 1.30 p.m. So if you knew Jean in any way, you'd be very welcome to come along and to share in that service. This afternoon we have Dressy Messy. It's all about the story of Joseph and his amazing Technicolor dream coat. So we're looking forward to having great fun with over 100 people who are attending our Messy Church event from 3.30 onwards in the hall with a meal at about 5 o'clock. If you are knitting sheep for the next Messy Church event, which is around about Christmas time, then can we have your sheep in, gathered in? Yes. Please, get the dugs out. 
by the 16th of November, so that's three weeks today, by the 16th of November, uh, bring them along to the church and then we'll get them out for the purpose and we'll explain a bit more about how they're being used nearer to the time. Uh, thanks to those who helped with the harvest lunch last week, over £320 was made from that for church funds. Fantastic effort. It was a great lunch if you came along. Uh, I'm sure you'll agree with me. If you missed it, then you really did miss something. It was lovely. And just one final thing, um, and that's to mention Life and Work. I know that only a few of you get Life and Work magazine now, but there's a very good article on page 27. Modesty forbids me from telling you uh, whose name is at the top of the page. Ah, it was me. <laughs> but it wasn't largely me that wrote it. It makes it look as if it was, but um, anyway. It's telling everybody about the service that we offer through our internet streaming and also particularly in signing our opening prayer and also trying to encourage other churches to take an interest in this. So if you don't normally get life and work, maybe you want to pick up one from November. Wow, that's a lot of news items and that's not even a tenth of what's going on in the life of our congregation. <coughs> Let's hear the word of God as we come to bring our praises to him this Sunday morning. From Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither, whatever he does prospers. Let's worship God in our opening hymn, one of the more modern hymns that we sing from time to time in our congregation. Light of the world, you stepped down into darkness, opened my eyes, let me see.
few weeks ago, we sang um, another song which ended in one of these kind of unusual notes as that one, that one does. It doesn't seem like there's an end to the song. And a few weeks ago, I said, I think that's because there should never be an end to our praise to God. It should just be ongoing. And indeed in heaven, in eternity, the angels and the people of God gather around to bring their worship to God every moment of every day for all eternity. And we join our voices together with theirs in praise. Now let's join our hearts together with them as we share in prayer. Let us pray. (laughs) What a joy, what a privilege to be here, Lord. We identify with the psalmist when he wrote, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Here we are, Lord, and we're here to worship you, to praise you, to thank you, to bring you the adoration of our hearts, to say that you are our God and we are your people. You are our Father and we your daughters and sons. We worship you in the beauty of your holiness. For you are perfect, spotless in all your ways. All that you do is for our good. Nothing that you do is wrong. We wish that we could say the same of ourselves, but we would be telling an untruth. For there are so many ways and times when our words and thoughts and actions Betray that our hearts are sometimes hard, sometimes dark, and very often far from you. But in these moments, we draw very near to you and ask that you, by your Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, will draw close to us. Help us to sense the majesty and wonder of your presence here in this place today. Through singing praise, through saying prayers, through listening for your word in scripture and in sermon, through the fellowship that we share with those around us and those in heaven and all over the world. Lord, grant us also a sense of your pardon That in those times when we find it hard to forgive ourselves for our failures and faults, that at the very least we know that you forgive us. For you've gone to the greatest extent to offer us that forgiveness. You've given the very life of your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. We thank you for him. And for his presence with us, both in this sanctuary, in our homes, and wherever we are. Help us to be good representatives, ambassadors for his message of good news. At home and in church and out there in the world. Always and ever. To the glory and honor of his most precious name. Amen. Thanks to Ray, who comes up and uh, signs our opening prayer Sunday by Sunday. Now let's sing God's praise as we celebrate the all-embracing type of love which he shows to us, the unconditional welcome that he offers. Let us build a house where love can dwell. CH4, number 198.
can only hope that someone passing the door of the church heard us as we loudly proclaimed that invitation. Now, here's an invitation to read his word. Let's turn together to our Bible reading for this morning, which is in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. Last week, we began our thinking in a series on essential Jesus. And over a period of months between now and next summer, we will be looking at the life of our Lord and thinking about what we can learn about him. So here's John's take in the beginning of his gospel on Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it or overcome it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling, his home among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, We've all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Amen. And we give thanks to God for this reading from his word. As we prepare to listen to what God might be saying to us through that passage about his son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Let's sing another song. This is from the Mission Praise Book. You're the word of God, the Father, from before the world began.
Speak to... Keep going? Okay, yes, we can keep going. Well, there's a lot of beginnings today. Not least because this is my first sermon here at Dale St. Andrews, and of all the things to go wrong, it has to be a mic, doesn't it? This is also the, the first sermon which is based on, on chapter one of the Essential Jesus book. If you've managed to get your hands on a copy of that book, brilliant. If you haven't, I commend it to you. It's a good read and it means you'll be able to follow what we're doing. But another beginning is John chapter 1. So a lot, there's a lot of beginnings this morning and that got me thinking. Often how we begin something says something about how we plan to continue. If you were to begin a story once upon a time, well, you've made a promise to the person you're speaking to that what they're about to hear is a fairy tale. One, one of my favorite beginnings of a story is, you'll never guess what happened to me the other day. And I love that beginning because I like to try and guess what happened to people. But the promise is that you're about to tell someone a story that they would never guess that happened to you. Even how I begin this sermon this morning says something about where we're going in this passage from John's Gospel. John had an intention when he began writing his Gospel. He had a plan. And we know what that is because if we skip to the end of the Gospel, he writes, I've written these things because I want you to believe. I've written this Gospel because I want you to believe who Jesus is. And so right from the word go in his gospel, he creates this passage of John 1, 1 to 18, where he is telling us straight off who Jesus is and why it is important that we believe in him. This morning our question is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Why is he so important? And to answer this question, I've picked out four words from the opening of John's gospel which really stood out as saying something about who Jesus is. These four words also have a connection with the Old Testament and hopefully I'll be able to share that with you as well. And the other amazing thing about these four words is they also tell another story, a much bigger story, a story which explains to us how it was that Jesus was able to come and to save us. So the first word this morning is the word, word. <laughs> this may get a bit confusing. And when I was Googling or searching for pictures on John chapter 1, I came across this cartoon and I couldn't resist sharing it with you. The person on the left is saying, this is confusing. The person on the right says, well, what? What is confusing? The person on the left is holding and reading their Bible, and he says, this word, word, is confusing. And then in the last section, the person on the right said, oh, it's Jesus. Jesus is the word. To which the person reading the Bible says, who? And I share that with you because if ever you felt a bit confused about this word, word, you're not alone. <laughs> In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Immediately when we hear those words, in the beginning, we're drawn to the Genesis passage, aren't we? In the beginning. So whatever John is saying about the Word, he's saying it's been there from before creation, from before time began, this Word has existed not only that, but this word was with God, this word also is God. And through the word, all things were created. 
So who or what is this word? Well, the Greek word being used here, and I promise this is the only time I'll mention Greek this morning. The Greek word is logos, the logos of God. Now, John is being very clear because he's reaching both his Jewish and Greek readers. For Jews, the word logos reminded them of the times in the Old Testament when the word was associated with the personification of God. For the Greeks, the word logos means that the word is the mediator between God in heaven and us on earth. So the word is a personification of God, also a mediator between us and God. And my friends, if this doesn't start getting you thinking about Jesus, I don't know what will. What better personification of God than the person of Jesus Christ? What better mediator between us and God than the Jesus who hung on a cross, restoring our relationship with God. Another aspect of words is that they convey meaning. If you want to get to know someone, you have a conversation with them, you talk to them, you use words to get to know people. So by saying that this word is God, John is saying that the word communicates something to us of who God is. Through the word, we can know God. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Word. Jesus is the Word who is the person of God, who mediates between us and God and ultimately communicates who God is to us. And about that story I was mentioning, well, John has started where all stories should start, and that is with God. The bigger story starts with God, who is the Word. Another word that jumped out for me was light. Jesus' word, he's also light. The light was coming into the world, and the darkness could not and has not overcome it or understood it. This reminded me of that wonderful passage in Isaiah chapter 9, which we read at Christmas. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. Who are these people that live in darkness? I'm afraid to say it's ourselves. We started with God in heaven and now we've come down to earth, which is in darkness and in need of light. So what does this light from God do for us? Well, I was thinking about the times that I've been away on boys' brigade camps or times when I've been out walking in the hills with my friends and it's gotten dark. And I'll tell you, if it were not for our torches, we'd, we'd have been gubbed. The light acts as a guide. It helps us to see the way forward. It keeps us on the right path. It makes sure that we don't end up in, you know, in a field with some sheep or anything. It keeps us on the straight and narrow, going toward the place that we are supposed to. Light is a guide, but light can also be a bit uncomfortable because light exposes things. Um, If you're playing hide and seek, you don't hide in a well-lit area, do you? You hide in a dark corner. And the light of God exposes our darkness, and that can sometimes feel uncomfortable. We sometimes don't like when God exposes our sin in the way that he does. But the light of God is not simply to be a guilt trip that exposes our wrongs. It's supposed to be this thing that guides us back to the right path. So even if the light is uncomfortable, even if it makes us feel awful about the way that we are, it still points us in the right direction to get back to the ways of God. 
And thirdly, what does this light do? Well, the darkness cannot overcome it. And what a comfort that is. In a world that seems increasingly dark on a daily basis, God's light cannot be overcome by the darkness. And that gives me such great hope for our world, especially in some of the situations we see. So we started with God, the Word, and the people living in darkness ourselves, and God has sent his light down into the world to act as a guide and to keep us on his path. But sometimes that's not quite enough because we don't always instinctively or naturally choose God's way, so he had to do something else. He had to do something else. God came down. The word was made flesh and made his home among us. So our third word this morning is home. I've chosen this picture. The word became flesh with a what I presume is a Bible, because that reminded me of something from Jewish culture. The Jews would say that the word made flesh refers to the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, or the Torah. They say that that is God's word made flesh because it literally is God's words written down in a physical form. And I share that with you Because it helps us to make sense of Jesus' words, I have not come to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law. Because Jesus, the word made flesh, was the embodiment of God's law in the Old Testament. And we know that because he is the only man to have ever lived precisely according to God's law. He was the only perfect human being. But this is not the word became flesh that we think of, is it? We think more of this next picture. The word became flesh and made his home among us. Christmas, it's only about 10 weeks away. Sorry. (laughs) Jesus came, he was born in this world. He lived as a human being. And this is significant because Although God is up here and we are down there, we cannot reach up to God. So he came down. God came down. He lived our lives. He lived the life of a human being. And this is so important for our salvation because only God could bear the punishment for our sins. But only a human being could be an adequate sacrifice for all of humanity. So God came down. He dwelt with us as a human being. In some translations, this phrase, made his home among us, is is described as dwelt among us. There's one that says he moved into the neighborhood. Do you imagine that? Oh, Jesus has moved in two doors down. But this captures something deeply personal about what God did. We talk about making a house a home. A house is four walls and a roof. A home is the place that we live. A home is that personal place that we go home to after a hard day's work and we feel comfortable and we feel safe. And you can walk into a home and you should see a person's personality all over the place. If you were to visit my home and come into my room, you'd see Star Trek ships and you would see painted models and you would see theology books and you'd go into this room and say, yes, Stuart definitely lives here. (laughs) A home is personal. And there's an idea of permanence to home. We say that people move house. We don't say that people move home. And so there's this very personal permanence to God saying, I have made my home with these people on earth. 
So we started with God, we had the people living in darkness. God sent his light down as a guide. It wasn't always enough, so then he came down as a human being and lived among us. And then the final word in our story from John's gospel is no. Why did God do these things? So that we might know him. When God created us, in the very beginning, there was an intention of a relationship there. God's plan was that he created humanity to be in a relationship with him, but that was spoiled. That was spoiled when Adam and Eve rejected God's ways. And that has been the story ever since. The relationship between God and humanity has never quite been the way that it was supposed to be. And so when God came down in the person of Jesus Christ, not only was he coming to take the punishment for the things that we do wrong, he was coming so that that relationship could be restored. So that once again, we as God's people could say, we know God. We know God. So often in the Gospels, Jesus says, if you have known me, you have known the Father. If you know Christ, you know God. What a privilege that is. I, I'm studying in Edinburgh. And one day when I was walking down the street, I was stopped by um, someone who is part of the Hare Krishna religion. And I love it when I get stopped in the street because it means you get to talk to people, especially if it's someone of a different religion because what an opportunity to share Jesus with them. And through our conversation, he, he said, you know, you can't know God. It's impossible to know God. We cannot know God. And I said, to a degree, yes, I agree with you. Because God is so big. God is so big that our human minds cannot comprehend him. But God has made himself known to us through Jesus Christ. To which he replied, oh yes, you're one of those people who believes that. So take that as a privilege. We're all part of those people who believe that we, through Christ, can know God. What a privilege. And so we began with the word God. We then thought of the people living in darkness whose light, God's light came down to those people as a guide but we still couldn't reach God, so he had to come down himself and live among us. And as a demonstration of his love to us, he has made himself known through Jesus Christ. And then through Jesus' death and resurrection, restored that relationship between us and God. So Jesus' word, he is light, he has made his home among us, and it is through him that we can know God. If we want to know God, we must first know Christ. And that is why I have a final question for us, which is from a sermon by Dr. S.M. Lockridge. He was an African-American preacher. You can look up this sermon on YouTube. In this sermon, he repeatedly describes Jesus in different ways and then repeats that question. Do you know him? Do you know him? If you can look at that question today and your answer is, yes, I know him, then I encourage you to be uplifted and to praise God that he loved us enough to make himself known through Jesus Christ. If you look at that and your answer to that question is, I think I know him, I hope I know him, 
then the chances are you probably do know him or you wouldn't be thinking like that. And so again, take encouragement that you know God through Christ. And if you look at that question and you say, no, I don't know him. I don't know Jesus, but I would like to know him because through him I can know God. Then all you need to do is ask. Through prayer, ask Jesus to make himself known to you, and he will. And through Christ, you can know God. During our prayers of intercession, there will be a time when we, as a gathered people of God, can pray for those who would want to know Jesus, and I will lead that. So that opportunity will come. But do you know him? And it is my sincere hope and prayer that you do know him as the word, as your light, as the one who has made his home with you and the one through whom you can know God today and always. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for your word and spirit through whom we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. May those of us who confess your name today never cease to wonder at what you have done for us. Help us to continue firmly in the faith, to bear witness to your love, and to let the Holy Spirit shape our lives. Take us into your care that we may loyally endure any opposition we may face as we serve you. And may we, with all of your children everywhere across this world, live together in the joy and the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask this, Lord Jesus, in the hope of your coming. Amen. And may God add his blessing to this, the preaching of his word for us today. We now have an opportunity to give something back to God's work for this church in the giving and receiving of our tithes and offerings.
Also in our prayers of intercession this morning, we'll be praying for the country of Jordan from the We Open Doors booklet um, that we've been working through for the last few months. Jordan is one of the more liberal Middle Eastern countries, but because of the Arab Spring, things are becoming more difficult for Christians. Traditional Christianity still enjoys a fair degree of privilege in this country and religious freedom. But the real issue in this country is for believers who come from a Muslim background. They are facing more violence and greater pressure from family, government and society for converting from Islam to Christianity. So we'll be praying for Jordan this morning. We'll also be praying for those, as I said, who are seeking Christ. So let us come before God in prayer. Let us pray. <coughs> Loving God, thank you for the offering which has been received today. We thank you that it is you and you alone who bless us in our daily lives and that through your blessing we are able to give something back to you and to the work of your church. It is our prayer that the offerings taken today would be used for your glory and for the spread of your gospel in this community in Motherwell. We pray you would guide those in leadership in this place that the spreading of the gospel would be in their hearts and would be a priority in everything that we do for you and for your glory. Lord God, we lift before you the country of Jordan where your people are facing persecution. We pray for those who are suffering because they have converted to Christianity. We pray for those who are part of your church in that place, that you would be with them and that you would strengthen and embolden them in the face of these persecutions. Help the churches across the world who are working in this part of the world to support and to uphold Christians, whether through prayer or by more practical means. We pray that the restrictions on non-traditional churches would be relaxed and that your people would be free to worship you in the name of Jesus Christ, their Lord and our Lord, their Savior and our Savior. We give thanks, Lord God, that there are those in Jordan who are coming to faith and so now we turn our hearts and minds to those a bit closer to home who are also seeking you. We pray for friends or family or loved ones whom we would love to see coming to faith in you. We pray for anyone who is here with us today, whether in the congregation or watching online, that you would speak into their heart and mind, that you would reveal yourself to them and that they might come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That they might know him in the way that we do. And we pray that those who are seeking you, Lord God, would connect with your people. That they would find a way in. That they would find a way to talk to believers. And that those believers would encourage their faith in you. In a few moments of silence, Lord, we lift before you our own personal prayers for others this day. Our Lord and our God, we give thanks that you assure us that our prayers are heard. And we wait patiently to see how you will answer them. We thank you that we know you through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're now going to be joined by the children from Sunday School.
yourself. Well, good morning to those of you who have just joined us. I was chatting with Derek just earlier this week, and we suddenly realized that um, you don't know who I am, do you? No, you don't. Because I've been here for a few weeks, and we forgot to introduce me. Because the first week I was here, it was a communion Sunday, so you weren't in. And then it was the October holiday, so you weren't in. And then last week, it was Derek doing the children's talk. And we forgot to introduce me. My name is Stuart. And I'm going to be here for the next two years, hopefully. All being well. See, I smiled at him there. He, was, he wasn't looking at me. Um, all being well, I'll be here for the next two years. And I'm going to be... First of all, a student minister for a few months, and then I'll start full time. I'll be here all the time, and I'll be the assistant minister. But I've come to speak to you this morning. I've brought something with me, and I wonder if any of you, I'm going to put these down because I'll need my other hand, do any of you know what these are? <laughs> Somebody shouted out, but... Seeds. Yes, these are seeds. Oh, I'm dropping them in the carpet. Whoever cleans up, I'm very sorry if these end up on the carpet. They're seeds. That's right. Now, what do you suppose we could do with seeds? Come to you. Um, plant them. You could plant them. That's right. You could plant them. Anything else we could do with them? Yes. Put them in the ground. Put them in the ground. That's the same as planting them, isn't it? But you're right. You could put them in the ground or a plant pot or all sorts. You could also eat seeds if you wanted. I don't know why you would, but you could eat seeds. Now, these particular kind of seeds are sunflower seeds. Oh, I heard some excited noises there. Do you know what a sunflower looks like? Yes, describe a sunflower. It's brown and it's yellow. It's yellow and brown, that's right. The face is yellow and brown. What else can you tell me about a sunflower? Is it a tall plant or is it a small plant? <gasps> it's huge. It's huge. They can grow to huge, huge heights, can't they? And they look beautiful, don't they? And nice and they, they look like the sun. That's why they call them sunflowers. Would you believe me if I told you I'd brought a sunflower with me this morning? No? Well, well. <laughs> Let's just see what, um, what we've got here. This is my sunflower. <laughs> what do you think of my sunflower? Is it as beautiful as we were describing? No. Can anybody tell me why? <laughs> Is it hard to guess? Yes. Well, it's, first of all, it's not summer. You cannot grow sunflowers in the winter. Right. You can't grow sunflowers in the winter. This was planted in the summer, though. But what has happened to this flower? It's dead. It's dead. If you were in any doubt, <laughs> this, this flower this, this is dead. Yes, it's definitely dead. Why do you think a flower like this would die? Now, we've already thought that in winter, 
you cannot grow a sunflower. So let's not think about the season. What other things could have prevented this flower from living? I'm going to come to you. I will learn your names at some point, I promise. You might have not watered it. I might not have watered it. I think that is very likely um, <laughs> that this was not watered. Um, or potentially it was overwatered. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. So if it wasn't watered. What else? What else do flowers need? Well, a few folk are shouting it out, but let's see if you know. Do you know? It's in the name. Have you forgotten? Sun. 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 Sun, sun, sun. sun. Lots of sun. Flowers need sun. They need light to be able to grow. So unfortunately, it looks as though this plant has not had enough water and it's not had enough light. Were you doing a story this morning about sowing seeds? Please tell me you were. (laughs) Yes, you were. Now, tell me what happened to the seeds that fell on the rocky ground? Does anyone remember? Yes. Yes. They didn't grow. They didn't grow. They didn't grow. They probably ended up a bit like this plant. Can anyone tell me what happened to the plants that fell amongst the thorns and the weeds? Yes. They died. They died as well. They died as well. Can anyone tell me what happened to the the seeds that fell in the good soil? The good soil. I'm going to come to you up here. Yes. They grew. They grew, didn't they? They grew because they had enough soil and presumably they had water and they had light. And you know, do any of you know what Jesus was talking about when he told that story about seeds? Do you know what the the plants were supposed to represent? Begins with a th. Th. Let's see if we know. For one, I wasn't going to say something with a fair bit. The plants represent people. The plants represent people. Yes, they represent people, but the people have something. Do you remember? It was faith. The people have faith. Some people's faith, when they heard Jesus' words, was like the plants that died. It grew a little bit, but didn't last very long. But other people's faith was like the good plant that got plenty of water and sun, and it grew, didn't it? Do you think you could tell me what you think the water and sun of our faith might be? We we would read one and we would talk to God the other way. There's a couple of clues. I'm going to, you're right in the middle. What's one of them? Um, The Bible. Yes, the Bible. We could read our Bibles. Reading our Bibles would help us in our faith. And the other way is talking to God. We've got a special word for that. Praying. Praying. Very good. We read our Bibles and we pray, and that helps our faith in Jesus and in God to grow. So you don't want faith like this plant, do you? No, no, you definitely don't. This will probably be going in the bin when we're finished with it here today. You want your faith to be more like the flowers that we've got up here this morning, bright and vibrant and lively. And the way we do that is to read our Bibles and pray. Let's do one of those things now. Let's say a prayer to God this morning for all of us, okay? Let's pray. Our Lord God, thank you for the stories that Jesus told us that help encourage us in our faith. We pray that you would help us to read our Bibles and to pray. And by doing both of those things, we would get to know you better and we would get to know God better. And by knowing you better, our faith will grow to be like a vibrant, living, colorful, beautiful flower. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your answers. Thank you for listening. Our final hymn this morning is Jesus is the name we honor.
we've been talking this morning about how we know Jesus through God, and so it is right that we give him glory and honor. So let this be an uplifting chorus that we can go away back into the world singing together. We stand to sing, Jesus is the name we honor. Now may the peace of Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you in the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing knowing him as your God. And may Christ's blessing be upon you now and forevermore. Amen.